Okay, thank you for inviting me to Liverpool and thank you for your kind introduction, uh, Jerry. Um, I'll split my lecture in a way in two parts. In the first part, I'll discuss the planning process of Hafen City and uh, the background for this redevelopment project. And in the second part, I'll discuss some, in a way, critical issues. And maybe that's more interesting for you here in Liverpool than the first part. Well, I start with some uh, images, uh, what was the case some years, some decades ago. So these port areas were closed areas. Uh, you couldn't get there, there was no public access. You can read, you were even punished if you get there. And that is going to be changed. So there were derelict areas, there were brownfields, no man's land, dangerous zones, unsafe, and facades of ugliness in a way. And when we have a quick look at this map of Hamburg in 1905, you can see this typical structure, what we call finger piers. You know, the keys are like fingers. And uh, in the um, 18th century, there was a decision taken in Hamburg that Hamburg should become a tidal seaport, not like Liverpool or like D London, for example, uh, with locked gates and um, problems in a way to get into these basins. So that was totally different. And this path was still uh, on until today. So Hamburg until today is an open tidal seaport. And the strategy is that all ships should come to Hamburg at any time, at any tide, at any size of the ship. And uh, the area marked in red here, that is the area which is now the Hafen City redevelopment area. And you can see uh, this, uh, in a way, typical structure of a port area in 1905. Well, until the 1950s, it was a working port, as you can see in winter time here. So, as usual, uh, casual labor, uh, dangerous work here for the dockers in the port area. And uh, until the 1960s, and until the 1970s, it was, in a way, functioning. And then this area became more or less vacant, derelict. These are some pictures I've taken in 1999. You can see there are still some cranes existing, but not used anymore. And you can see uh, some small boats, some sheds, and um, as uh, most of the buildings were built here after the Second World War, so the, there are only uh, sheds and uh, no warehouses from the 19th century in this area. Well, as in all seaport cities, uh, we can uh, recognize this cycle of transformation and. In the beginning, it starts with the retreat of the port, the retreat of the port next to the city center because that, uh, there's not enough space to expand. And then the more modern part of the port will be relocated normally to the parts where there is deep water access next to the sea. That's also the case in Hamburg. And then afterwards, there's the period of neglect, of urban decay of blight and decline. And then, in a way, kind of planning process starts, reprofiling, and then well, some of the projects were implemented, kind of rejuvenation. The area becomes revitalized. And of course, sometimes there is a kind of gentrification afterwards. So this is happening in all seaports around the world. It started in North America already in the 1950s and the 1960s, also related to the crisis in shipbuilding that went to Asia, to Japan, and later to China. And uh, with the loss of job, ops, uh, jobs, of course, and afterwards in Europe, in many seaport cities like London, like uh, Hamburg and like Liverpool, of course. And well, what kind of strategies we have for this uh, transformation? And um, well, we can make a kind of typology for these approaches. So for example, London was in a way office led in the beginning. So uh, London Docklands should compete with the city of London. That was the idea. 
at that time when Olympia and York came in to have a modern business district, an office district, uh, the Manhattan of the 21st century, how Margaret Thatcher called it at that time. Well, mostly offices. Meanwhile, there is also a lot of housing, but as I said at the beginning, it was offices. Another strategy may be housing clad, and a, an example for that strategy is Amsterdam. You can see uh, the Eastern Docklands in Amsterdam, and it's really only housing. There is a school, there is a kindergarten, but there is no shopping, there are no offices and things like that. So the strategy was very much focused on housing, because there was a housing shortage in Amsterdam, there was a spread and sprawl to the periphery, and the, uh, city decided to have this area redeveloped with houses, so you can say housing lab. Uh, Michael Herbert, last time probably mentioned Bilbao, the, the kind of uh, cultural lab, you can say, with the Guggenheim uh, Museum and with the so-called Bilbao effect, which uh, many cities try to copy, but in a way which is not easy to copy because there was a unique situation in the Basque country at that time which made uh, the Guggenheim possible and I think it cannot be uh, copied everywhere. And for example, event-led, you can take the example of Barcelona. In Barcelona, the redevelopment of the waterfront started with the Olympics. The Olympics had been the started point, and in a way it shows a strategy how you can use these kind of events uh, for transforming the waterfront and uh, regenerating uh, the waterfront, which was also blocked in Barcelona. There was no public access to the Port Vale in Barcelona, for example. So, uh, these are examples uh, started in the 70s, 80s, and in the 90s. And in a way, uh, what was done in Hamburg afterwards, uh, in a way, is a kind of uh, latecomer project, because, of course, you could learn from these experiences made in North America, made in London, for example. And in a way, from the beginning, Hafen City Hamburg was started as a mixed-use-led development. So that's a difference, of course. On the other hand, meanwhile, in Bilbao, there are also uh, residential parts in this area included, and as I said, in London, also residential. And, uh, Barcelona, of course, also office, and so on and so on. But as a starting point, these cities use different strategies, and in a way, in Hamburg, it was from the beginning mixed use. That's quite important. So, when we go further uh, with this example of uh, uh, Hafen City in Hamburg, you, you can see this map uh, with the surrounding line of uh, red. And this is uh, the half, uh, port district, and for the port district, a special authority is responsible, the Hamburg Port Authority. And the land in this area is owned about 95% by the city-state of Hamburg. And um, you can see uh, some areas marked in blue. These are redevelopment areas transforming along the northern shore of the river and here in the southern area called Harburger Binnenhafen. So these were the first projects for redevelopment and for transforming the waterfront. And you can see the Hafen City uh, project with uh, the red line uh, as the first larger project. These other ones were just small step-by-step -step projects and the Hafen City in a way is a huge area which was started with one uh, planning strategy. What's important also on this map is the area marked in green. That was until the beginning of this year the Freeport area. and. Uh, uh, this area was protected by fences and there have been gates you had to pass and maybe you had to show your passport and so on. Uh, and that was changed by a law by the uh, European community. So since the 1st of January this year, there is no free port in Hamburg anymore. And marked in yellow is also important. These are the new container terminals built a decade ago 
Altenwerder Container uh, Port Altenwerder and you can see uh, how the port moved into the western direction and into the southern direction and as I mentioned before uh, this area next to the city center where there is the name of Hamburg written th uh, this area was in a way uh, uh, free for redevelopment. You can see here now the Freeport in a way is gone. It's not on this map anymore. And uh, you can see again the red line, uh, which is important because the project of Hafen City was located in the beginning in the port area. And in the port area, residential is not allowed, offices are not allowed, only port related functions. So it is necessary to change the border of the port district to make this transformation possible, to get their uh, offices and uh, housing and things like that you have seen uh, in the video before. So uh, that was, a, in a way, a political decision uh, that uh, a, a kind of a deal that the port authority gives land for urban redevelopment to the city which can be transformed. And this is a an important political decision, of course. So here again, you can see these uh, different port projects along the northern shore of the river Elbe. It's called String of Pearls. That means there are special, spectacular architectural buildings, single buildings, kind of string of pearls, you know. Uh, and then you can see this area of Hafen City, and then in the southern area, Harburg Inner Port, which is quite unusual for Germany, a uh, dock port, uh, which is also going to be redeveloped in, in the middle of everything. Now you can read IBA, which means International Building Exhibition, and IGS, which means International Garden Show. And this project, um, is, in a way, is a leap across the river and integrating this island called Willemsburg uh, into an urban redevelopment strategy. And uh, we had this international building exhibition just uh, this year, and uh, there are several spectacular ecological modern buildings, uh, fascinating architecture. And uh, the, the idea is uh, to transform this island uh, where we have a lot of Turkish population, a lot of unemployed population and to improve this situation. Uh, but uh, the, uh, on the other hand, that the people who live there, that they can stay there, that are, they are not going to be relocated. That's, in a way, the task uh, for planning. Well, that's the area, and you can see how it combines, in a way, the northern shore of the river Elbe with the southern part of the river Elbe and how, in a way, this area of Willemsburg, which is the geographical center of Hamburg, now can become also the center of Hamburg in the future. Of course, that will take time, because the uh, center of Hamburg, uh, historically, is north of the River Elbe. Well, uh, now, when the project was started, in a way, of course, um, you can say that there was uh, uh, some kind of deal between the Port Authority and uh, the Planning Department. Here again you can see the green line, the free port district, the yellow line with the port district, as I said, residential not allowed, uh, offices not allowed, only port-related functions, and then you can see the district of Hafen City. In, on this map, you can see it's located in the port area and it's located in the free port district. So two decisions necessary to make the development possible, change the line for the port district and change the line for the free port district. And as I said, that was already done this year for the whole uh, free port district here in Hamburg. So the idea was um, that this area with these uh, finger piers I mentioned before, next to the city center, north of it, uh, can be redevelopment, redeveloped because it cannot be used uh, for port uh, uses in the future. It's not possible, for example, to handle containers here. You know, these narrow uh, finger piers will not allow container handling. 
And uh, so the idea was, in a way, um, to take this area, to sell the plots, and to take the money to refinance the new container terminal Altenwerder. So there's this kind of connection, this kind of deal which was made, because uh, normally in Hamburg there's this kind of saying, what serves the port serves the city, and the port is very important, and you cannot uh, change the lines of the port district, but in this case it became possible because the money selling the plots should be used to build the new container terminal, Altenwerder CTA, container terminal, Altenwerder. That's already done. Meanwhile, while the project of Hafen City still is on, under construction. But that's important to understand as a background how uh, the project uh, came to a start. So it was, in a way, uh, very much uh, economic-based uh, in the beginning. And uh, here you can see the situation um, in 1995. You can see the railway lines coming into Hamburg, and you can see these sheds. You can see some ships. So at that time, there was a bit of a working port, but not that much. And then um, for the master plan, uh, there was uh, the perspective to get about 155 hectares for redevelopment here, 55 hectares um, of uh, water, 100 hectares, uh, about uh, 383 acres for land, which can be used. Net building land is about 60 hectares, and uh, the overall extension east-west is about three kilometers, north-south is about one kilometer. And uh, there should be built about 5,500 units for housing, and at the end, that would mean as a uh, household size of two persons, uh, about 10,000 or 12,000 residents in this area, and about 40,000 jobs. And this political decision was taken in 1997, and then was a clear implementation strategy that the project should be completed in about 2020 or 2025. With, with these figures, the master plan competition was started. And you can see uh, the mayor, the head of the planning department, and uh, there had been about 200 entries for this master plan competition. Then uh, at the end, there were six invited to more to do more detailed plans, and at the end, the winner was Kees Christian, the uh, Dutch architect, uh, together with a group from Hamburg called Hamburg Plan. They won the competition, and you can see here their design, their urban design, uh, with many uh, of these U-type buildings always open to the south, to the river, to allow a view to the river. And uh, I can discuss also the other entries, but that would take too much time. And this uh, master plan uh, winning competition was taken over for a public master plan, of course done by the planning department. And here again you can see uh, some of the important issues of this master plan. Uh, well, uh, the yellow buildings are some iconic buildings at this uh, end of the keys and at, at spectacular sites marked in red. That's the warehouse district I'll discuss later, which in a way is the entrance and the connection to the city center. And then you can see over there the bridges crossing the river Elbe. And at that area, there should be a high-rise office uh, project started. Well, the existing building, there, there had not been many, as most of the buildings had been destroyed in the Second World War. And you can see uh, there is only this area of the warehouse district with uh, uh, red buildings. Otherwise, only sheds and buildings from the 1950s and 1960s. <clears throat> so in a way, you could say it's a kind of a tabula rasa approach. There are no buildings in this area, and 
you can do more or less what you want. And uh, of course, that opens up a quite flexible strategy to deal with this area. And of course, all these red buildings here are listed buildings, so you cannot uh, change them. They are protected, they are listed. But these sheds here on the other map in uh, black, they of course could be demolished without any problems. And as I said before, uh, the land on the port area is owned by the city-state of Hamburg. That was also the case, of course, in the Hafen city area. And you can see marked in red, that was owned by uh, the city-state of Hamburg. Marked in yellow, that was owned by the railway, but uh, after the first planning decision, it was possible to acquire most of the land in this area. So meanwhile, about 90% is owned uh, by the city-state of Hamburg. And of course, uh, that's a good opportunity to control the development in this area. So as I said before, the development agency which was established especially for this purpose to redevelop this area is owned 100% by the city-state of Hamburg. It was founded in 1997 as GHS, that's not important. And it changed the name to Hafen City Hamburg in 2004. And the development agency is responsible for development, for infrastructure, managing, marketing, for selling sites, for planning procedures, for projects, not for the master plan, of course. That was the task of the planning department. And the city center of Hamburg, next to the Hafen City District, will be extended by about 40%. And of course, that's a fantastic opportunity. And uh, the strategy reads like this, this is a quote, a unique chance to plan and to develop a new model of the European city, whatever European city is. Well, uh, as I said, mixed-use development uh, from the start on, so a lot of discussions about every plot, uh, how this mix can uh, made possible. And you can see here, here, it's not that important, I'll discuss it a little bit later. Uh, Orange is uh, housing, uh, yellow is mixed, and uh, offices are here in uh, light yellow. So you can see it's a fine grain of mixes in every neighborhood uh, from the beginning here. And um, you can see uh, the implementation strategy started in the north and started in the west, and then it moves further to the east. And you can see this line here starting in 2002. That uh, was uh, the year when the first buildings got buildings permission. And then it moved further to the east. And now we have reached uh, the, we have finished in a way the western part where you can see this uh, dark line and the eastern part is more or less under construction now. And at the end you can see 2023 or 2025, of course, uh, well, uh, that depends on many issues on the demand for offices and for housing. So uh, the public investment for infrastructure was about 2.4 billion euros, that's about 2 billion pounds. And the revenues from selling the properties uh, is about 1. Point billion euros, and pounds 1.28 billion. And the private investments in this area expected is about 8 billion euros, or about 6.8 billion pounds. So in a way, these are some important figures because uh, the infrastructure, uh, the public infrastructure got at the end so far more expensive than it was expected in the beginning. And um, when you uh, have a look, uh, re remind uh, the master plan, you'll see that there are several neighborhoods identified. and. Uh, this perspective was, uh, again, important for the implementation strategy. And you can see here this different neighborhoods uh, identified with more housing, with less housing, and in a way with a kind of a unique 
correct um, character and uh, the strategy is one district but ten different neighborhoods and you can identify in a way this variety of neighborhoods. Well, in a way, uh, here another map uh, with the completing buildings until 2013. You can see in red and again you can see this canal called Magdeburger Hafens on the, the uh, western edge. Most of the buildings are completed on the eastern edge. Some of them are under construction and uh, meanwhile uh, also uh, some residential buildings are finished. So uh, some critical issues um, and I think this may be more important for the discussion you have here in Liverpool, how to deal with Liverpool waters. And uh, well, uh, you already mentioned the tide and of course flood protection is also an important issue in Hamburg. Also the difference between low tide and high tide is only, only uh, 3.50 meters, so it's lower than in Liverpool, but uh, what can happen, you can see it here, that parts of the area can be over flooded. And, uh, uh, in the case of uh, emergency, there is a network of bridges and higher levels on the first floor that you can always get on the higher level of land. And uh, you can see uh, here some uh, doors uh, on the right hand side which are closed. So these are steel doors and they have to be closed when the, we have this case of a flood and then normally there are announcements in the radio and in the TV, please remove your cars, but uh, well, some owners uh, haven't heard and <laughs> they <laughs> forget their cars. Yeah, and uh, here you can see, uh, for example, this is a bar and uh, when the area is flooded, the doors are closed, the bar, the bar is closed, of course. And uh, here you can see in a way it's a kind of a tourist attraction meanwhile because the flooding takes some hours, three, four, five hours and then again there is a low tide and then everything is quite normal again. But um, once or twice a year we, we have this case of a quite high flood and then things like this uh, can happen. And so what, what to do with this? And uh, uh, from the beginning there was a discussion of building a dike or a flood protection here uh, on the western edge of the Hafen city area. But uh, a dike or a flood protection would not allow ships coming in uh, and uh, for that reason uh, the Port Authority said no, 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 we will not agree with that. It's absolutely necessary that the ships must come in at any time. So the idea was uh, to lift up the level of land, uh, but not in the whole area, but just in some parts of the area. And you can see the land in green, that's flood protected. So that's a kind of a, a polder solution. And uh, this higher level of land, in a way, of course, is connected so that you can get by via the streets and bridges on the higher level and the red line in the north, you can see that's the line of dikes and the land north of it, that's protected, that's on the higher level. But with this solution, it becomes possible that even if parts of the Hafen city area will be over flooded, you can always get via this green streets the higher level of land. But of course, it's uh, expensive and uh, in a way, uh, it's a quite flexible strategy on the other hand uh, because uh, you, you only have to lift up this part where, where you can see the street here and the, the part behind you can use it for a garage or whatever and uh, then you get these uh, uh, boulevards along the river which can be over flooded in a way it's a kind of a cascading system uh, but that makes it not necessary to lift up the whole ground, so just a part of it. So it's more flexible and uh, well, um, when these uh, boulevards may be over flooded, uh, in a way it could be also attractive and uh, well, no, nobody will be hurt uh, by this. 
And here you can see uh, at the end uh, when the eastern part of Hafen city is going to be built, there is also this kind of polder solution. And you can see again, the boulevards are on a lower level. So that will not cause any damages. So that's possible. And in a way, that's the strategy. On the other hand, this is a good map to demonstrate that uh, the strategy is to get public access to all parts of the Hafen city redevelopment. There is never the access to the water blocked at any point, always public access. And I think that's a very uh, important issue for waterfront redevelopment projects. Well, uh, the next uh, issue in a way is integration, isolation, and at the end also gentrification. So the problem is, of course, what I already mentioned before, how to define the area for <coughs> intervention. So when you read the master plan, you can always read Hafen City is the largest urban redevelopment project in Europe, 100 hectare. But if you have a look at other <coughs> seaport cities like Bremen, much bigger, Dublin, much bigger, London, much bigger. And when you compare it with Liverpool waters, I think it's about 60 hectares, so it's a bit smaller. But um, of course, uh, it, it's not important to be <coughs> the largest project. It's more important to be the best project, I think. And when you compare it with other seaport cities and projects, you can see the size in hectare here. So of course, Shanghai is uh, incredibly large, and London is also much larger. But in a way, that's not uh, important. It's important for public relation, for making an image. But even more important, of course, is um, to get the best strategy for redevelopment, not the size of the area. So for example, what they did in Bremen, they included the surrounding areas. And that's what they also did in Dublin. So the redevelopment area in Dublin along the Liffey is quite small, but the neighboring uh, neighborhoods next to it were included in the project, that there are links possible to get better schools and kindergarten for these areas, which are very often deprived areas where the dockers lived and uh, people working in the port. So when you have a look back at Hamburg, you can see there are also neighborhoods next to the Hafen City redevelopment, but uh, they are not connected with the Hafen City uh, development. So uh, they are separated. So uh, splendid isolation in a way. And of course, Hafen City is a prestigious project with uh, expensive apartments, while the surrounding areas are quite poor areas. So in a way, I think uh, that had to be discussed, how you define the borders of such a redevelopment project. Well, the next issue is uh, public transport. And um, at the beginning, there was this idea of having a kind of people mover, like in London, Docklands. And you can see here the, the red line. Uh, that was the first idea. Then there was a, then I, um, another idea of a tramway, but both ideas were not implemented at the end, uh, there was a, a solution uh, extending the existing subway. And the reason was uh, that you don't have another traffic system, but just extend the existing system. But of course, it's very uh, expensive, because you can imagine uh, going under all uh, these canals and uh, uh, rivers uh, needs to be quite deep uh, with the subway and, of course, uh, makes it uh, problematic. And you see what happens. Meanwhile, uh, there are, especially uh, during uh, the end of the day, a lot of traffic, car traffic, and uh, so public transport is important. And uh, what's quite good, in a way, is that uh, the subway is already finished, the subway is working, and uh, you can use the subway. So the subway is not going to be started when the buildings are finished, so the subway was started first. And I think that's very important for 
redevelopment project that you have a good infrastructure. And you can see another map above with all these digging and tunneling, uh, building all these uh, subway stations. Well, the next issue is uh, heritage. And uh, Hamburg applied uh, this year for World Cultural Heritage. And uh, the application is under the way. And I hope we, we uh, get it from uh, ECOMOS. And it's not my handy. No? <coughs> my mobile phone? No? Um, so, as I mentioned before, there is the warehouse district, and you can see in the beginning, the warehouse district was included in the redevelopment project of Hafen City, marked in yellow, and here you can see with the red line, it was excluded. And um, um, here you got uh, these two uh, parts of. Uh, uh, the applications, so there is a historical office district built and started in 1910, 1912, and then there is a warehouse district. Uh, and the warehouse district, in a way, is a linear structure blocking the access from the city center to the future development of Hafen City, while the historical office district is in the north. And you are quite familiar probably in Liverpool here with uh, world cultural heritage and related issues. So uh, this was the structure in 1888, and at that time it was uh, uh, very modern with these transfer sheds and then the warehouses and uh, connecting with rail, this linear structure. Uh, very modern at that time, copied by many seaport cities. And when this warehouse district was built, 20,000 people had to be relocated that the warehouse district could be built. But now, of course, it's more or less empty. It's going to be reused because you cannot handle containers here. And it's not built for containers, of course. So here is another image, and you can see how these two districts are connected. And um, of course, the important question is, uh, what about the buffer zone? And um, Hamburg did not <coughs> an application to become World Cultural Heritage, for example, in 2000, because the project of Hafen City was not started at that time. Now, most of the buildings, especially here, you can see they are finished now. So they are existing, and uh, in a way, they, they are the buffer zone now. And uh, in a way, they must be accepted, or they should be accepted, but they are reality. And that makes, of course, a big difference if uh, the application would have been started in uh, 2000. Well, uh, ICOMOS uh, would have said, well, there are no new buildings, office buildings, steel, glass buildings allowed next to the warehouse district. But well, we'll see uh, how this application goes. Here again, you can see these two uh, connected districts. And here you can see uh, the buffer zone. And of course, now some of the modern uh, mixed-use buildings are located in this buffer zone. And uh, of course, in a way, it's uh, problematic. And I included one image here uh, from the situation in Liverpool, and of course the question is also here, is it going to damage uh, the historic structure uh, with the three graces, or um, is it uh, just an extension, uh, not uh, that much related uh, to the world cultural heritage? Well. The next uh, quite critical point, in a way, is the so-called Überseequartier, and that's, in a way, the city of Hafen City, the shopping district, where there had been about, in the plans, about 1,000 inhabitants and about 7,000 jobs, a shopping center. And uh, what makes a big difference is that this area, you can see it here marked in orange, was given to one developer. So far, all the projects were small plots, parcels were given just to one developer. So 
we had many, about 100 developers, small developers so far. And now one big developer is taking over this important centerpiece of Hafen City. Well, and you can see what happened. Um, the part north of it so far was realized, but this area marked in red was not started yet. There is a subway station, but no shops, no offices. Well, the reason, of course, is that uh, after the financial crisis, the investor, ING Real Estate, Essen and Property Finance, and Gross and Partners, well, uh, had uh, many problems, to say it uh, uh, very relaxed way. And, uh, well, th they were not able to continue with the project. And you can see uh, north of this red line here, uh, that part was started, but was not very successful. So a lot of empty uh, offices and uh, um, um, residential areas. Um, and that was one of the reasons why this, they go, not going on with the second part of it. And of course, that's a big crisis for the project, uh, because in a way, the centerpiece, the heart of the Hafen city, well, is not going to develop in the next future. Now they will discuss uh, new contracts, maybe also with other developers. You can see, for example, these two towers uh, were designed as hotels. Then there should be a cruise ship terminal, also not started. There is only a temporary cruise ship terminal. So uh, it's probably really important how to get this thing going to be started Again, here you can see some images. There is a pedestrian zone uh, through this area. And uh, you can see how it should like in the evening, this curved street and uh, uh, this, this idea uh, of having a mix of uh, different shops, smaller shops, larger shops, offices, residential, and so on and so on. But uh, in a way, there was not such a big demand for uh, this area, and on the other hand, it's not that attractive that it was expected in the beginning. Here again, you can see the empty site, and north of it, there are many buildings under construction, and another image north of it, the tower cranes, and in, in the southern direction, nothing happened. And you can see the two temporary cruise ship terminals now, uh, which are used by cruise ships, but uh, in a way there is uh, nothing around uh, and, well, everybody expected the uh, centerpiece of the Hafen city here in this district and uh, two more images when there is a cruise ship, what happens. And on uh, the image here uh, above, you can see the subway station under construction, now it's finished, but when you get out of the subway station, you can imagine uh, there is nothing around it. So this is really an important issue, uh, how they are going on um, in negotiating uh, this project and how other developers and investors can be come in uh, to get it done, to get it implemented as soon as possible. Well, another project, uh, the most iconic project in a way, is uh, Alp Philharmonie. Uh, Elbe Philharmonic Hall, uh, uh, the so-called Warehouse A. The warehouses in Hamburg were public warehouses, so there is a Warehouse A, there is a Warehouse B, and so on. And this warehouse, you can uh, imagine when you compare it with the other structure, is a quite modern warehouse. It was built in the 1950s. There was a warehouse before, demolished in the Second World War. And then it was built as a modern infrastructure, and uh, there are some articles that it was the most modern warehouse at the time, because you can see that the uh, goods from the ship can be unloaded directly to a train or into the warehouse. And that was very uh, comfortable at that time, but on the other hand, of course, you cannot handle containers here. So what happened was this huge structure in the 1980s, it became empty, was not used anymore, and ideas were discussed what to do with it. And then this idea came up, 
having a concert hall on top of the warehouse and using the warehouse, the old warehouse, just as a garage and then have a terrace where you can see the people uh, on top of the warehouse and um, then this concert hall combined with a hotel and with some flats. And of course the, the, the reference was the Sydney Opera House and uh, uh, there had been a lot of discussions that at this spectacular point we need a flagship building, we need a spectacular project and this, in a way, this should be the project and maybe some of you know that there had been many protests in Sydney also, there was a referendum in Sydney that the project should be stopped, that it was not stopped but the architect turned off and yeah, but in Hamburg we have similar discussions. Again, these are some plans and you can see um, the terrace, then you can see two concerts hall on top of it, a hotel, five-star hotel with a foyer and uh, some, quite expensive of course, apartments. And you can see uh, the garage, uh, the former warehouse is used as a conference center for uh, wellness, fitness and things like that, but most of it is parking space for about 510 cars. So that's under construction and that's uh, an image uh, how it may look like when it's going to be opened. But the problem in a way was um, that um, uh, the uh, horizontal powers uh, uh, putting on the warehouse uh, made it not solid enough, so the construction was not fit to ca in the vertical level, yes, but not on the horizontal level because of this wind powers, uh, that all the structure, the internal columns had to be taken out and to be reconstructed with uh, concrete, of course, uh, to build the new garage inside. And of course, that makes it much more expensive. And what happens, this is a newspaper article, at the beginning there was an estimate of costs, uh, so the public, the taxpayer should pay about 60 million euro. Then you can see what happened, 2006, 440 million euro, and the architects say, uh, you know, it's the architects Herzog de Morand from Switzerland, and they, for example, did Tate Modern in London, Olympic Stadium in uh, Beijing, and so on, so quite prestigious architects. They say it's uh, not only a problem of acoustics, uh, no, it is not. And uh, here you can see another newspaper, so how the euros are pulled in and pulled out to get it done. And well, this is uh, the next uh, estimate. You can see now it's uh, 461 uh, million euro the taxpayer has to pay and at the end there was a final uh, agreement, this is 2011 and 2013, that the taxpayer will have to pay 560 million euro. So, yeah, uh, getting more and more expensive. But on the other hand, of course, what to do with the project started and stopped at this point as a ruin. So. Yeah, it's quite complicated and there was a discussion to take an other uh, construction company in or who was responsible for it was, as, um, you can see, a, a chart with all the stakeholders. I will not go into detail because, of course, the politics were involved, uh, the constructing company was involved, the private company was involved and last on least the architects, so who, who was finally responsible and yeah, we, we don't have a, a finally a discussion on that. So the next issue in a way of course housing and uh, public housing or what we call also social housing in Germany, uh, this uh, uh, newspaper article says Hafen City as expensive as never and this is uh, a residential building uh, with the most expensive apartments here in Hamburg and most of them are empty but some famous uh, football players, boxers and so on uh, bought uh, 
some apartments for prestigious reasons, probably. And um, here you can see another map um, which is important for housing uh, in this area in the next future. So in the beginning, um, as I mentioned, uh, there was uh, always a bid for a plot and who made the most, the best bid in a way got the plot and built his project. And so you can say it was very much market-led in the beginning. And now it's getting to become more plan-led. And this is a very detailed strategy, how housing, residential offices, um, and shopping, and things like that will be mixed in the future. And the important decision was made uh, that also public housing or social housing or social rented uh, landlord housing, as you call it here in Britain, will be included in the future. You can call it affordable housing or cheaper housing or whatever. And that's, of course, important. And it's, in a way, a political decision because the city owns the land and you can get the land for a cheap price or even not paying a price for the land or you can pay a lot of money, of course, then the housing also gets more expensive. Yeah, And so this is a strategy uh, for the eastern edge uh, of this area. And uh, in a way, it's not that attractive than the western part because it's uh, the uh, distance to the city center is far. And there is uh, one subway station, yes. But on the other hand, uh, there are also some other critical issues. And here at the um, eastern edge, you can see some high-rise buildings. And that's one, one topic I haven't mentioned before. So in a way, the strategy is to have a dense mixed-use district, but not to have many high-rise buildings. And with high-rise buildings, I mean uh, buildings with uh, 10 or even more floors. And the strategy in Hamburg is that the skyline with the churches should dominate the skyline in Hamburg and not high-rise buildings. So very few high-rise buildings are going to be allowed, like the Philharmonic Hall on the Warehouse A or some office buildings in this area. So otherwise, it's six, seven, maybe eight doors high, but not higher. A dense, compact urban structure, yes, but not uh, many high-rise buildings higher than that one. And in a game, you can see here more in detail this uh, differentiated a grain mix of uses. And you can see that it's a lot more housing and marked in blue here, cheaper housing. And this district with number 10 uh, is uh, for especially for, for students and for the so-called uh, creative classes, which cannot pay high rents, so they get space here, because uh, they are also, of course, important for the mix in this area and uh, to, to make a more dense, livable neighborhood here, uh, not only with uh, high uh, expensive residential apartments. Well, the city center, uh, as I mentioned before, is going to be extended by the project of Hafen City. And is in many city centers or in all city centers, there is not a lot of residential. And that's also the case in Hamburg. You can see it here on this map. Red means residential. And the opportunity, in a way, is with the development of Hafen City, you get more people into the city but with this project of half and city. So as I said, 5,500 units. And of course, that means a mix of population, uh, shops, uh, residential, and, uh, and um, people, walking, tourists here, and so on and so on. So um, that's important, not only to have offices here, but also residential. And here you can see the perspective is really to discuss very in detail these different types of neighborhood. So along the waterfront, along the canal, 
uh, inside this canal next uh, to this key, uh, next to this pier, next to the railway, and so on and so on. And uh, I could have gone into detail discussing all these different neighborhoods, uh, but, well, they are under construction now, but in the future they will be really quite different. Well, what about uh, rents uh, for housing? So uh, some figures here. Well, the months, we count monthly rents in Hamburg. The average is about 10 uh, euro per square meter. That means about 8.7 pounds per square meter or 0 0.8 pounds per square foot. Maybe these figures uh, are useful. And for new housing, new housing of course is more expensive. In Hamburg you normally pay up to 14 or to 15 euro per square meter and you can see what that means in pounds and in square foot and you can have a kind of comparative how expensive the project is. And in half and city, of course, uh, the housing is uh, more expensive because of uh, foundations, because of flood protection, and because of uh, expensive infrastructure. And well, the the rents uh, by projects done by developers are up to 20 euro per square meter. That's about one point. Uh, one uh, pound per square foot. There are some cooperatives, not public housing, but cooperatives which provide what they call affordable housing. The rents are up to also to 14 uh, euro per square meter and you can see what that means in pounds. When you buy, uh, well, the cheapest um, thing is about uh, 4,000 euro per square meter and it goes up to 12,000 uh, euro per square meter and you can again compare it with pounds and square foot. And as I said before, so far there was no uh, social housing in this area. So what kind of people are living in the Hafen city district and we have a kind of an investigation now which shows us the population in 2009, so it's two or three years ago. So as I said, there was no residential population before, not allowed because of a port district. And most of the people are double income, no kids, so called dings, many singles, very often older people, the return of the empty nesters returning from the periphery, from um, the surrounding areas selling their houses because the kids have went out and they want to return to the city center. So middle class, high income population. And the area is supported now by a sociologist uh, to get this neighborhood on the way and to get meetings and a newspaper and uh, grill barbecue parties and things like that. And there are many second homes. And of course, the important question is, uh, as a mu municipality, what can you do um, to get this kind of mixed, uh, lively neighborhood? Um, you you have, don't have a guarantee when people are buying second homes that they move in, so they are empty. And when you get these statistics, okay, in the first part, we got about 2,000 inhabitants. But, yeah, theoretically, who's really living there? And it's really a different issue. And uh, you cannot control it in a way when people uh, from Dubai or wherever buy second homes there and they come there for, for a week or for two weeks when the Elbe Philharmonie will be opened and yet it's not open. So, last not least, uh, uh, another critical issue, noise and pollution. And you can see the line of the railway here leading uh, to the main station in Hamburg. And you can see some of the houses will be in the water with uh, uh, piles, of course, and things like that. So there is uh, noise from the railway on one hand, and there is, of course, noise from the port. So there is cargo handling, and that's noisy. And when you live 
when you have your apartment next to the port, you must expect more noise than in a, a house at the periphery. And um, here you can see uh, what kind of noise you can expect. So most of the noise comes from the railway, and that's one of the reasons why uh, north of the railway line there are, is no residential, south of it there is a bit, and especially on this southern pier there is most um, of the residential part uh, in these different neighborhoods. And of course on the southern edge here there is a port, and the port of course also makes a lot of noise. Uh, well, that's the railway, but on the other hand, we got the cruise ships. And meanwhile, I was told today, you expect also many more cruise ships in Liverpool now. In Hamburg, we got 160 stops last year. The CO2 emission is similar to 64,000 cars per year. So uh, when you live next to uh, this um, area when you live um, next to this group ship terminal and you bought an expensive flat, of course, well, you're not very happy with this um, emission. And, uh, there are strategy, of course, that you can uh, diminish this emission by using land power, not uh, burning this uh, uh, petrol oil, um, but they are not used so far. But on the other hand, of course, you can see it's really an important event when these cruise ships come in, like the Queen Mary II. Tourists from all over Germany come to Hamburg, spend money, stay in the hotel, as well as the cruise ship passengers. So, yeah, that's really, really important. So, um, I'm coming to the end of my presentation and just discussing very briefly what kind of lessons we can learn and maybe what you can use uh, for Liverpool waters from uh, these projects all around the world and especially from the Hafen city in Hamburg. So on one hand, one must say in a way that all these container terminals, these infrastructures for container handling look similar all around the world. And you can use a port in China or Genoa or in Marseille, in Rotterdam or in Liverpool or wherever the same requirements always for container handling. But on the other hand, you can say no two seaports are alike and no seaport of the world is like another. They all have a different history. They all have redeveloped parts of the former seaport areas. And that, uh, in a way, results in a big variety uh, of waterfront projects all around the world. But uh, seaports are also places in which local and the exotic, foreign and familiar poverty, riches, tradition and modernization meets. And in a way you could say uh, in seaports we got a kind of culmination of innovations on one hand in economy, society and culture. They are command centers for global economy and forerunners of globalization. Yes. and. Uh, so when you have a look at these images uh, uh, from movies, uh, from novels in Hamburg, and um, of course you may know uh, uh, the song Ferry Cross the Mersey and things like that. So uh, heritage is really important when we discuss the redevelopment of these areas, and especially older colleagues probably uh, know about these images and they know about uh, the history and that's, that's really an important issue. Um, here again, uh, some, some music players uh, making music, and the, the red light district, Reeperbahn, the famous Reeperbahn, of course, was also integral part of the seaport, necessary for the seamen when they got uh, at land and had a lot of money, want to spend the money, want to have the fun, of course. Yeah, but that was the case in the past and uh, was uh, important for all these images and is a part of heritage. And on the other hand, in the future, I think we'll have a kind of spatial separation of the physical port functions, very much related to deep water access, and the centers of command and control. They can be somewhere else. 
and explanations for the local built environment and the transformation of former port areas, waterfronts, must always include, I think, uh, these global decisions from the so-called global players making investments in port cities all around the world and looking for logistic strategies and not very much interested in uh, local issues. And, of course, on the other hand, uh, they make uh, decisions top down. Why? On the other hand, the municipality, of course, is involved in democratic decision making processes. And that takes more time than to do a decision top down as a head of a company. So, um, in a way, th these are just uh, some ideas. And uh, uh, what's uh, important, I think, you can see this kind of, of course, you can see, well, London, you can see Shanghai, and uh, you can see uh, Paris, and so on and so on, uh, on this image. And this kind of mix, uh, of course, um, well, that's what, what we got, more or less. But how can we deal with the local history, with the local past of the port? And so some kind of general advice, I think, which could be important. So I think we should avoid trends for copies, kitsch and shady design. Avoid sameness. The, in North America, it's called SHE, which means seaport history entertainment. So that's the cluster they use there normally and well, make big profits sometimes of it. So avoid history as theme parks, Disneyfication. The waterfront should not become a Disney park. Nostalgic images of the past and monostructures, which is really an important issue. But try to develop uniqueness, USP, unique selling position. History matters, seaports have a specific urban port culture and to develop authenticity, local identity, and a proactive approach would be useful. So again, local culture and identity versus mishmash and sameness. I think well, that's the message of my presentation. And thank you for your attention and I'm looking for questions and comments. Thank you.